Being human, do you ever wonder what makes us who we are? Our habits, preferences, or where we came from? We are expressing ourselves in thousands of ways every day through our choices. Let's have a conversation with people who are having interesting lives. My name is Alan Walker. I'm a doctor of chiropractic and a human being. Oh, well, welcome to the latest podcast of Being Human. And I'm overjoyed to have with me um, a, the legendary uh, Tim Shorb, who is a chiropractor, worked in America, and um, probably we'll find out where else he's worked in, in the world, uh, and is now working or uh, living in Cancun, Mexico. So um, it's the furthest we've been on with the podcast, and I'm very pleased that we've, we've got Tim on. So welcome, Tim. Thank you, Alan. Yeah, so, so if it's okay with you, there was a, I always start off by asking some questions about uh, people's family <clears> and where they come from, and, and uh, because I'm nosy, and I'm sort of interested in, in people's lives, it's, it's, it's what makes us who we are. Um, but with you, it's a little bit different, because when we're talking about you and your family, well, we're going to find out, aren't we? And I'll, I'll let you explain more. Can I just ask you a little bit about uh, where you were brought up? I was born and brought up in Cortland, New York, which is a town that's halfway between Syracuse and Ithaca. Many people know Ithaca because uh, they heard of the school Cornell University. Uh, they call it a little piece of Europe in central New York. It's a very pretty town. And Syracuse is the, uh, one of the cities that's uh, located between Rochester and Albany. Albany is the state capital. So that's the central part of New York State. It's not um, uh, New York City. I'm so with it's, it's a different mindset. We have more cows than people up there. <laughs> so you said about so, the, the, the school that's quite famous. What was it called, oh, the college? What was it famous for? Well, there was New York Chiropractic College Oh, oh, in Ithaca, Cornell University. Yeah, uh, what was that sort of? What was it famous for? Do you do you know? Uh, it, it, I, I think it's where Dr. Fauci went to school. I call him Dr. Falsy, but yeah, Dr. Fauci went to school there. Oh, right. yeah, it's that's, one that's... of the Ivy League. It's one of the Ivy League colleges in yeah. in the United States. It's... Yeah, well, it's, I'm sure it's a very good one, but the, just the sound of his name gives me the creeps. No, not really. That's why. I wonder why. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll perhaps tip, that's that's for another podcast, maybe another podcast. So you were brought up there, and do you have any fun memories of uh, early days and li living in that area? Were you there was swimming or walking or anything, cycling, being in the countryside? Did you work on a well? Farm? It's 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 a it's a ski town. People ski there in that area. There's there's hills and mountains and. It's not like the Adirondacks. The Adirondacks are the really, really big mountains in New York State. They're farther east, more towards, they're, they're farther east and north of New York City, the Adirondacks. And then south of that are the Catskill Mountains, which is where the all-inclusive resort started. Okay. Hutcher's Country Club. That's, okay. that's, where, that's where the concept of the all-inclusive, which is, all along the coast here where I live in Cancun, Puerto Morales, Playa de Carmen in Mexico. But that's where they started. Yeah, it sounds a really pretty place. Of course, uh, you, if you're brought up in a skiing area, um, you know, I'd expect you to still be enjoying skiing now. But you're, you're not actually in a skiing area anymore, are you? That, it's a different type of resort. No, the people down here are fascinated by the concept of snow. So I get out my iPhone and I show them pictures of the snow banks that are above my head and I'm six foot three, you know, and they say, oh, that's so exciting. But they didn't live there for uh, nearly 70 years, you know, like I did. So it's a different, yeah. it's a different thing when you, it's a different thing when you have to uh, clean your, your front windows off and your car off and scrape it off every morning and shovel yeah. the snow and it or get a, somebody to shovel the snow in my case but it yeah. gets a bit it's annoying a, doesn't a, it? <laughs> it, it, it 
and and I don't downhill ski anymore, so that that that's not particularly exciting. So where Don, you where you're living now is in Cancun, is that right? Yeah, we're about 25 miles south of Cancun and about 25 miles north of Playa del Carmen. Those are the two areas that most people know about in this area. Okay. We're on the Yucatan Peninsula. It sounds it sounds beautiful. I've not been to Mexico. It, um, it is absolutely gorgeous. And it's made, sunny every day. What made you move there? Oh, about when I, uh, I was, <laughs> this goes back. I was bit by a brown recluse spider, and it really took me down for the count. 44% of the people die uh, when they go through the normal uh, medical treatment for it, which is basically IV antibiotics. And you're supposed to swell within four to 48 hours maximum so that you know something is wrong. But I was so incredibly physically healthy uh, in my mid forties when I was bit that I did not swell for 11 days. By that time, the infection had passed through my system and uh, had started to create an autoimmune response. So I eventually developed type one juvenile onset diabetic in my mid forties. And uh, I lost 70 pounds of muscle mass, which is not unusual either. And uh, I, I really had a tremendously difficult time. At that time, I think I'd been in practice for approximately in chiropractic practice for about 34 years. And I experienced every single neurological symptom that any one of my patients had ever complained to me of in that time. Wow. And I didn't, I, I, it really, it really brought me to a greater understanding of why people sought my services as a chiropractor and a clinical nutritionist, because I had been extremely healthy. I, I think in my life, the biggest thing I ever had was my first year of uh, chiropractic school, chiropractic college in Chicago, outside of Chicago in Lombard, Illinois, a school called NCC at the time, National College of Chiropractic. Now it's referred to as National University of Health Sciences. And I had uh, just uh, enjoyed wonderful health that first the first semester I was there was the first time I hadn't been adjusted for approximately let me see, September October November December four months and I developed a strep throat and that was the only sickness that I had ever had in my entire life and so uh, with the round recluse bite my right leg swelled up my calf swelled up twice the size of my thigh and during those years, I had been working out regularly for approximately 11 years at that point. And I was in tremendously good. Uh, you know, there's a difference between being healthy and being fit and being well. And, but I was, I was not only healthy, but I was fit. And so my, my immune system started fighting this toxic neurotoxin, the the, the venom of the spider off without me knowing it because we do that innately as we know through chiropractic philosophy and I I didn't I just was tired and I didn't know why I was so tired but at that time I was also going going through a divorce so I I heard I felt that it was and 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 the people around me that I consulted with felt that it was just stress from the divorce but it, it was this the poison that was in my system that I wasn't aware yet because I mean it was April Fool's Day 7 30 at night I was going to bed uh, I was under the covers which by the way now that I know a lot more about spider bites 77 percent of the spider bites occur between the sheets and I was I felt a 
bite on my right knee and I thought, well, huh, I, I guess I got bit by a spider. And what do you do when you get bit by a spider at 7.30 at night and you're on your way to sleep? You go to sleep, right? Yeah. That's what most people would do. And so uh, I went to sleep. The next morning, I got up. I felt okay. I went to work. And over the next week and a half, I just started getting more tired and more tired and more tired. But I kept pushing through, taking care of my patients. And one morning, I treated approximately 50 people in my office in the Syracuse location. And then I was driving home to Cortland, which was where I was then living. I had a home office there and I had about another 20 people scheduled down there. And I got halfway on the drive, which was about 20 miles into the drive. And all of a sudden my tubular moccasin, it's, that's what the shoe is called. It, 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 it's a, a loafer that stitched with leather around it busted off of my foot because my leg swelled so bad. Wow. Okay. At that point I had a cell phone in my car and I had service. This was a number of years ago. So you didn't have service everywhere back then, but I was fortunate I had service and I called the head pharmacist for one of the large pharmaceutical chains who was also a patient of mine. And I, he, he ran 30, he was the director of 35 pharmacies and I called him up and I said, Hey, what do I do? Should I go to the emergency room? Now, there's one thing I want to mention is there's only one group of people that dislike pharmaceuticals more than many chiropractors. And those are really good pharmacists. So I said, <laughs> should I go to the, the emergency room? And these were his exact words. Oh, God, no, Tim, they'll kill you there. He said, they'll pump you full of IV antibiotics until you don't have any symptomatology and they'll send you home. And then sometime within the next few months to few years, you'll just probably drop dead and die because they'll wipe out all the good bacteria in your system and you'll be in trouble. But I know this really good homeopathic pharmacist he's one of the best homeopathic pharmacists around let me give him a call and i'll see what he can do to help you and so that was the beginning of my adventure and uh he said part of the problem was that the medical physicians in upstate new york are not familiar with seeing these bites in other words those those spiders are not prevalent there they're more prevalent in Mexico, so I decided to move here. <laughs> They're more prevalent yeah. in Mexico, Oklahoma, Arizona, Florida, the Carolinas, and the, the south, south and southwestern part of the United States, even over the Baja Peninsula. But you didn't see them in upstate New York. You know, I remember the, you're the only person, Tim, that I've met who um, has also been bitten by a spider because um, <laughs> I was, I've been bitten by one as well. Um, and a, a little story, if you don't mind me just, just popping this in, I was, I driving, would be delighted. Yeah. I was, I was just wearing, I'd, I'd got up out of, out of bed and I threw a shirt on and I went, I was going driving out to go and see my daughter uh, in Kettering, which is only about um, it's about 40 minutes drive. And I just, it was just like a, a zipper jumper I'd put on over the top of my, of my skin. And, and I was, I'm sitting there on the seat and I felt this itch on my back and I was like, maybe I picked up a bit of grass or something that's in, in the, in the bow. I was like, that. Oh, and it started to really, and it was getting worse. And I thought, no, this isn't normal. So I pulled over and the itching was getting quite intense. And I carefully took off my, the, unzipped this sports top and uh, looked back and I saw this half squashed spider trawling down, down this, the, the, the inside of the top. And the uh, the area that was that where it had been on my back was already raised, and it was uh, it looked like a like part of the Philippines on my back, and was starting to. I looked in the mirror and I could see it with the car mirror. I could see it was quite a large area, and it was only a very small spider. So I've had uh, I have reactions to insect bites. Uh, I know we've got enough chiropractic here. I went to the hospital because it's another interesting. I went to the hospital and uh, I went into the uh, straight into the accident emergency and i said 
I can get a reaction to bites and I think I've, I've come into contact with a spider and it's, and they just laughed. And I said, well, I, I do need to see someone in case you know, I have this huge reaction. I don't want my airways blocking and, and uh, I showed them my back. So I said, okay, well, we'll, we'll bring a nurse through. So eventually after waiting about half an hour, they took me through into a separate cubicle and they, they said, let's have a look. And I showed them, they said, how do you know it was a spider? That, you know, and like we very much, you know, like this is, remember this is England. And I said, because I've had a similar thing once before. So they said, well, how do you know this was, you know, are you sure? And I said, yeah. And I pulled out, I'd got a, a, a Tic Tac box and I'd got it inside and you should have seen the nurses jump. Then they suddenly took it uh, very seriously. But so yeah, um, insect bites and uh, of all sorts can, uh, especially spiders can cause all sorts of problems. And so I'm very much aware of that, but I've never met anyone who's moved away from an area that because they're worried about um, the bites of an insect, but yours is quite you know, extreme. I I didn't move away from the area for that reason. <laughs> but, <laughs> okay. But, but in fact, over the course of the next year, I was, uh, had the opportunity. Uh, it, it, the brown recluse is the only carnivorous spider on the planet. It first, it, it, it's different than like, for example, a wolf spider. And I have no clue what the spiders are in, in the UK. I, I, don't I don't consider myself to be a spider aficionado. I just know a lot about the brown recluse because I had to deal with it. But um, I had 19 people that came to me from all over, uh, even different states in the United States for care because it's a small community. And when someone is bit, especially in that area, they tend to look for other people that might be able to give them some information about it. But 44% of the people die within four years. So you, you, you so, think that chiropractic helped you with this, helped you get over this, 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 um, this, this, well, this pause, this bite. Absolutely. Yeah. Tim, do you mind me ask, sorry, go on, go on. You know, no, go ahead. I'm, I'm, I, I want to know more about this, this spider bite. Go, go on, t t tell me. Well, the, the the brown recluse, only the females bite. The males are used for nothing other than, than reproduction. And then yes, the it's pretty much like humans, them. then it's a human type situation, isn't it? <laughs> uh, it's only the females that bite, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, um, they they first inject you with their digestive enzymes which anesthetize the area in which they choose to get the prime cut. And then they put their tentacles in you and Lord knows what goes in with those tentacles. Uh, you know, I don't know, parasites, bacteria, viruses, possibly uh, chemicals, which they've been exposed to like, uh, you know, like the insecticides or whatever is on them and so that it, it can create an infection but they then proceed to suck one to two square inches of meat out of your system if the spider is not observed and the person doesn't you know kill it or brush it off of them or something and i didn't observe it i just felt it and i never saw it and they call them reclusive. They're not really brown. They're really tan. But that those digestive enzymes anesthetize the area where they're looking for prime meat. Uh, there's a number of people who have been bit by them before, uh, but they they didn't like Billy Graham was bit, and he didn't deliver a sermon for nine months. Well, I was going through a divorce, so I sort of had to work. And um, I was also, you know, trying to take care of my kids when I had my, my two sons. And I was trying to take care of them and work and do everything else. So I, I didn't have the opportunity not to <clears throat> work. And I continued to work. And it was, and, and uh, I did all right for about, eight years, I proceeded to get better. I, I was working with a chiropractor who used to be the uh, head of the 
American Chiropractic Association. And he helped me tremendously. And then uh, he had had five heart attacks, two cardiac arrests, and six defibrillators put in him. And he took a fall and went into hospice. Uh, I was about 49 years old at that time, I think. And he then could not treat me anymore. And then I tried to find somebody that could help me. And I really didn't find anyone that helped me tremendously in that area where I was living. But eventually, um, I had to quit practice for uh, about three months. And I went to Albuquerque and stayed with my sister, who was a chiropractor out there. Do you mind, Tim, do you mind me, do you mind me just cutting back a little bit? Because I don't want, I, uh, what I want to do is I want to start this afresh. If you don't mind, this is what I want to ask you. Because it goes on to your sister. You'll understand why in a moment. moment. You're from a family of chiropractors. So your parents are both, were both chiropractors? Yes. Because then it will explain more about where, where you're coming from. Because that's, for, <laughs> for me, that, that's, that's been one of the things. One is that you've got a beautiful, big, solid, tight family, which I love to, to see and, uh, and observe. But, but also that you, you're talking there about struggling to find a chiropractor because of the, the, obviously the vast expanse of America that you're all dotted around in. Um, you're not very close to each other necessarily, but most no. of you are chiropractors. So can I yes. ask you about your parents? I mean, uh, how do they, the, the two chiropractors, were they chiropractors or did they, did they or, uh, meet at university or what was this? What was the story there? It's a cute story. My, my, my father was a New Yorker. He was born, bred, brought up in Brooklyn. And he had decided he was going to either become a plastic surgeon or a chiropractor. So he traversed around Manhattan and New York City and met with a number of plastic surgeons, which was new in the medical industry in the 19, you know, 1929, 1930, that, that period. And he found out that the plastic surgeons, in order to develop a practice, had to um, socialize a lot with the general practitioners and the internists and throw cocktail parties and do that type of stuff. And that wasn't his world. He also went and visited some of the most successful chiropractors in New York City, one of them being Anton Meister. And Anton Meister was a very successful chiropractor. In fact, at the Palmer College of Chiropractic in Iowa, there's an auditorium named after him that he had funded. And he, he knew a lot about chiropractic when he entered school. He was also had received a degree as a, 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 a naturopath. So he was a naturopath. He went to chiropractic college and it was his first day there. My mother, on the other hand, knew virtually very little about chiropractic. Now, in the 1920s, um, uh, 1910s and 1920s, um, there weren't a lot of female in professionals school. There weren't a lot of females at in universities. But my grandfather, her dad, had saved money from his job, his work, to be able to afford to put her through Cornell University. So he sent her to Cornell University, which was not that far away from the town that they grew up in, which was called Groton. And Groton was an even smaller town than Cortland. But there was a chiropractor, an old timer, that had a traveling practice. He had a horse and buggy, and he would travel through upstate New York and give people adjustments and teach them about chiropractic. So my mother's father, or my grandfather on my mother's side, had never or had uh, cardiovascular disease. He had angina pectoris and some other issues with his heart. 
And all my mother knew was that when this chiropractor came through and passed through town on his horse and buggy, that my father did not exhibit symptomatology. But she had never seen him be adjusted. She'd never even met the chiropractor. All she knew was what her dad had told her was that it was a drugless, non-surgical form of health care and that it kept him healthier. That's what she knew. And she thought that sounded good. So she went to Cornell University, which at the time there was no Cornell Med. She graduated, I believe, in 1937. 1937, she graduated. No, that wouldn't be right. 1934, I, I stand corrected. 1934, she graduated in 1934 from Cornell which was basically, she was taking a pre-med program there. So most of her professors were medical physicians who were teaching uh, the course. And they would say to her, why on earth would a, why on earth would you wanna throw your life away to become a chiropractor? Now, why don't you just study medicine? And she said, you just teach me what it is that you're supposed to teach me and leave me alone. Well, especially being a beautiful young woman, why would you want to go into chiropractic? And so she did graduate with a dual major and she traveled to New York City. She had never been out of the small community that she grew up in. It was a different era, you know, there weren't a lot of cars or people didn't didn't just go to New York on a regular basis. So she went to Manhattan and she entered chiropractic college there. And their first class, their very first class was neurophysiology. Now, being a chiropractor, you know that your first class might have been anatomy and physiology, or it might have been dissection, or I don't know what what the educational program that you went through in 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 the UK was but yes pretty much here that. you pretty much that you learn how to manage a table you learn how to uh <laughs> take those type of classes so neurophysiology is tough you know i mean it's 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 expansive and and their attitude was if the students can can track neurophysiology, they will understand the basic premise and philosophy of chiropractic, which is that the central nervous system controls and coordinates every organ, every gland, every tissue, and every cell of your body, and more importantly, adapts your body to the, to the stressors and stresses that we succumb to in life. And so, they figured if they, if the students can grasp this, then they will be good students and we can really turn out good doctors. Well, uh, how they had it, it was a setup. They had a setup with the U.S. federal marshals and they brought U.S. federal marshals into the class to arrest the professor in front of all of the students. The students themselves were probably there were uh, there was a percentage of female and a larger percentage of males in the class but the, many of the students didn't really know that much about chiropractic i'm sure as much as my dad did my mother knew very little except she was very politically astute she was a very uh, knowledgeable person in terms of government and the constitution and and, and politics and business, uh, which she had studied at Cornell. So they walked into the class, they handcuffed the professor who was a doctor of chiropractic. They handcuffed him, balled and chained him and dragged him with his hands behind his back out of the classroom after arresting him for practicing medicine without a license. At which point, 75% of the women that were still in the class got up and left and never came back. 
50% of the men that were in the class got up and left and never came back because they thought they were getting themselves into something that was illegal or dishonest or bad. And my mother, who was a small town girl, had just met my, my father in the classroom and was sitting next to him. It was a circle in the round where they went to school. And she leaned over and she nudged him and she said, hey, Bill, if they're that afraid of what we're doing here, we better stick around because we must really be on to something. Absolutely. That Absolutely. Was, Can I ask a question, Tim, before you move on? Yeah. I, I need to... What is this rubbish practicing without a license? What was that? What was that all about then? Okay, uh, ch chiropractic was not licensed in New York State until 1965. Prior to that, chiropractic had been licensed in the early 1900s in California and Oklahoma and many most other states, but there were three states that it had not obtained a license in. So my mom actually started the practice in 1941 in this small town in Portland, New York. My dad was called into the military. They had just gotten married. And so he was in, he was in World War II in the Philippines, Guam, uh, Australia, New Zealand, and, and the, the, the uh, that area of the globe. And my mother started the practice. But from 1941 until 1964, 65, don't quote me on that year, it's, it's in that range. As I was born in 55 and I was about 10 years old, Governor Rockefeller was in office at the time. And I know that in our profession particularly, we associate the Rockefellers with not only the oil industry, but the pharmaceutical industry. Yeah, dark, dark stuff. Dark stuff. That's what we look, that's what we look at it as chiropractors. The well, Rockefellers generally. Biblically, not, do, you, do you know what the word pharmacy is in the Bible? No. What it stands for? No. It, it, it is called sorcery or witchcraft. That's mm -hmm. what it is associated with in the Bible. So, uh, and and indeed, John D. Rockefeller and his father were sort of uh, had a, had a had a real snake oil pitch about them. And in fact, that's how they started was was uh, selling snake oil. They were they were basically the original Rockefeller was. A, uh, and this is not me saying this. This is well known. He was a, a con man. He was he was a snake oil salesman, and um, promised people cures with different tonics. But eventually, they figured out that the leftover petroleum byproducts from the oil industry could be used as medications, and that's basically how many medications are made even today. But Nelson was sort of a black sheep of the family. He was the most charming, exciting, charismatic individual. He he had a different he had a different beat to his drum than the rest of the Rockefeller family did, I believe. I know that because as a child he was he was friends with my family. And he had an osteopath in his family. And he knew about spinal manipulation. He knew about chiropractic adjustments. And he knew there was a benefit to natural health care. And so he felt that it was wrong that chiropractors uh, were not licensed and that they, they needed to be licensed for the protection of the public as well as for their own protection. And he made sure that the state government got a license in, but that license was very difficult. Uh, it was, or that that first board that they wrote was very difficult. It was written by two chiropractors, Maylon Blake, Blake and Julius Dintenfass. You probably haven't heard of Maylon Blake, but you might have heard of Julius Dintenfass somewhere in your in your studies. Julius wrote the first one of the first books for the public on chiropractic. 
It was called Chiropractic, a Modern Way to Health. And I believe it was written in the 1960s or 70s. But there was also the Committee on Anti-Quackery that was very, very, very active. It was a, a committee that was one of the stated committee, committee its stated mission was to contain and eliminate the practice of chiropractic across the globe. So Tim, one of the questions that I'd, I really want to ask you is the whole family are involved in, in chiropractic. It's your, your parents met at university. Um, you've, you've got a number of siblings. Um, I understand that they're all chiropractors. Um, you're a chiropractor. Your wife also works within um, healthcare and in, in a, a vitalistic way. And even your son is working within the profession as well. So it's, uh, is that right? Yes, that is correct. Wow. So I, and, and my, live, living all over the country, all over America. Yes. My mother and father practiced in Cortland, New York. My dad, my mom practiced about 55 years. My dad practiced about 60. I have a sister, Ali Shab Lehman, who practices in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Uh, her her ex-husband runs the chiropractic, or runs uh, part of the chiropractic program at the University of Bridgeport, Connecticut. They're no longer married but she still practices in Albuquerque. And my other brother-in-law practices in Virginia Beach. Both Jimmy, Holly, and my brother-in-law, Scott Banks, have been in practice for, I don't know, seven or eight years longer than me. And I've been in practice for 46 years now, this year. My, my wife is Dr. Dawn Stranges. I say she's the strangest doctor in the world, <laughs> but she'll bring you a new dawn. She has a PhD in energy medicine, transcultural studies, and she's traveled all over the globe looking at how different cultures, I, uh, I, it's almost anthropologically, I guess, how different cultures heal and what, how, what, what healing modalities they use to uh correct illness or stay healthy so so does she um i mean obviously we're not talking about chiropractic uh, per se now but with it that her belief system um is that the body a lot of diseases are caused from something and that she's looking to find out what that something is so she can help them repair that themselves is that right yes she how, how does she do that how does she you know what, what's is it nutrition she uses uh, she uses nutrition. She uses homeopathy. She uses energy work, energy medicine, hands off the body healing. People, when I say energy medicine, people, most people say, "Oh, she does Reiki." And I'm like, "Yeah, yeah Reiki on steroids." Um, it's 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 a whole nother world of what she does. And if it wasn't for her, I probably wouldn't have been around because she really helped me tremendously with the work that she does. She uses kinesiology and muscle testing uh, in in her work too. She is my son, my son Tristan, who is also Tristan Shop. He's in, on Facebook. He's Tristan L Shop. My son is calls her. The, my soul surgeon uh she she does a lot of work with emotional blockages as well so but she works with the energy field outside of the body and how we are affected by it and how that can create even vertebral subluxations or manifest in other types of conditions but it would make a lot of sense wouldn't it because um you know, we can all be very positive about things, but we're lying to ourselves. Ultimately, diabetes is going through the roof. Disease um, all over the world seems to be growing. Um, and the only people seem to be doing well out of it is the uh, is big pharma. So um, something needs to change. And it's obviously, it stems from something, uh, whether it's nutrition, um, sugar, um, 
it, 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 the list sort of goes on stress from work wi-fi bluetooth uh, electronics you know how we're living our life today isn't exactly like sitting calmly next to a stream in the jungle is it you know this is chemicals we're, we're being affected by lots of things that aren't chemicals, natural to human. food yeah. additives words we can't even spell or pronounce are put in our food so our food is no longer food i like to emphasize that it's the it's the food and drug administration it's the food and drug administration and our foods have become drugs yeah that's quite simply it i mean it's 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 not really that much of an oversimplification it's the facts yeah, I mean, I can't argue with that. And I, and, and I don't think anyone, if they're going to be honest about it, sh should argue with it. They just need to look outside the window and see how things have actually changed. I was speaking to a chiropractor um, early, earlier today and we were, we were talking there about we only need to look back to the 70s at the outdoor swimming pools and see how the people looked healthy and slim. And oh. now you look at the people you meet in the street and uh, obesity is just gone crazy. And, Especially uh, in the U.S., even more in the U.S. than than in Europe. Well, we like to follow you. You know, the, the, the UK yes. likes this. It's, it's following on fast, and of course, all the foods that you have there, we're delighted to say we have them here as well now. So it's, um, you know, all of these fast food joints, we have them here, uh, and people love them. If only they knew what it was doing to their cellular systems. Some do. More yeah. and more people are becoming aware. Yeah, that, that's 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 what we need. Can I ask you? I mean, with, the, with going back to the family and this chiropractic uh, royalty, I like to think of you. Really, all all of you. Well, if, if thank you. Yeah. Not sure that we are royal, but <laughs> with with the we're so unique. Many, you are definitely unique. With so many of you doing chiropractic, I was. It just crossed my mind the fact just going from your parents and through to all of you who have worked within the chiropractic profession. How many people have been helped in the most tremendous ways after going through working with a general practitioner, their GP, their doctor, um, surgery, all sorts of uh, medications, and eventually come out the other side and go, none of this has worked. I need to try something else. And they've come and found someone working in a, in a, in a room, in a, in a, uh, maybe in a, a local clinic, and called a chiropractor and they've been able to do some amazing amazing work and with you so many of you working like that how many hundreds of thousands of people have been helped and supported by your family and i, I think that just blows my mind I mean, have you got any stories along though along that that you could tell well, me after my father passed and in the process of moving down here to, to mexico i was going through his old records and he had a he had an index card where he had listed the numbers of in, uh, multiple family generations that he had treated from the different small towns and communities around the area. And I noted, I think there were 350 families that he treated. So he treated the grandparents, the parents, the kids, the great-grandchildren from 350 families. That's that's a lot of people. I know I probably had nearly 40,000 patients that I saw over my career of 46 years. And I could not begin to tell you how many people my brothers-in-laws or a sister have helped. Yeah, amazing. Any of them I mean, you know, I I think my my busiest day ever. I I've seen sort of um 65 people which was which was enough for, it was enough for me um and certainly at the moment um I'm, I'm building another clinic um in rugby so i'm expanding to, to two clinics from one to two clinics so i'm doing something else at the moment but I, even even still i'm still seeing sort of uh, 30 people a day for yourself i think you'd you'd chew over 70 and help and support 70 people easily within a day is that right Yes, I, I usually, uh, well, I had an office, I had a 10,000 square foot office in Manlius, New York, from 84 to 90 something, I think it was. Um, 
And there I had seven assistants and some associate doctors, but I myself saw over 70 people a day usually for, for, I don't know, a lot of years, a lot of years, more than a decade. Yeah. And more is that, a decade. Is, is that the same for the other members of your family as well? You know, did you, did your dad see about the same people? Was it? My dad saw a lot of people. My mother had a different type of practice. She saw less people. Um, and I, I, I don't really know the numbers, the, you know, yeah, I mean, you know, I have no, I have no idea what the numbers are of my sister or my brothers in laws or what, you know, what they. What ultimately, they it only really matters the people that we're helping, you know, it's, yeah. but, but it, but it be did... one person it would make, it could change the world. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Am I right in saying that I, I heard a story um about yourself and about the, your parents who are deeply uh in the belief the body heals itself and of course i i believe that as well um you did you fall out of a tree or come off a, a, a bike and, and damage your arm no i was when i was about six years old i climbed a barbed wire fence uh a fence around a a, a schoolyard and then it had the sharp points at the top it wasn't, I guess I shouldn't call it barbed wire. It was, it was wire, you know, like that at the top. And yeah. I, my dad was standing next to me on my right. I was on his left. I was shorter than him. He was watching my older brother, who was 11 years older than me, play sports. And uh, he was watching the game. And I was like, kind of bored and I was trying to climb the fence and when I got up there my arm got stuck over it and I ripped my arm open from my wrist to my elbow and it was tourniquet time and I got my dad's attention and he went oh my goodness but he never acted like you know he had been he had been in in he'd run the uh John Hopkins x-ray clinic in uh the Philippines and Australia New Zealand, New Guinea, those places and the, the Southwest. And um, he, he never, he didn't act at all like he should be, you know, he didn't want me to feel any fear. So he had to like, oh, there's nothing to this, you know. And I knew when the blood was gushing out that there was something to it, but he, he calmed me down by not making me think that I was going to die that minute picked me up, carried me home. He had no tourniquet. He had no bandages. He had nothing. And it was about two blocks away. So when he he would treat patients, he would put a handy full paper towels down as a headrest, over the headrest. And he just had a habit. He'd pick them up and he'd collect them and he'd put them in his, his rear pockets. And so he had some of those in his pocket and he grabbed those. I have no idea how much mucus or snot or whatever was on it, but he, <laughs> threw him, he threw them in my arm, brought me home, put some uh, Brabon, it was called. It's a trace mineral ointment that took about nine months to make. It was made in Telford, Pennsylvania. And uh, again, because the FDA was so powerful, they wouldn't allow you to ship it across. He, they weren't allowed to ship it across state lines. So my father would have to drive about four and a half hours to pick it up from an organic chemist whose name was H.C. Weber. And he, he brought me home, put that in the arm, uh, actually made my older sister put it in my arm, which she still uh, complains about. <laughs> but, uh, put put that in my arm and while he adjusted my neck bandaged my arm and and it healed and i had no loss of function of my fingers even though tendons and everything were cut because the body heals itself naturally from above down inside out if you give it half of an opportunity to do that the problem is we throw stitch you know anybody else probably would have had a hundred stitches in the arm you know so it was a, it was a different it, it was it was a different world back then it was a very different world um and i lived in a different world than the majority of my friends but yeah. i was 
I, I, I learned and I saw personally with myself, with my family members, and I started working in my dad's office when I was a teenager. And I saw people come in with just incredible problems. You know, like one man came in one day, this was back when the price of the adjustment was $7. And uh, someone called him up on a Sunday and said, um, could you see my, could you see this fellow I know? He's had hiccups for 17 days. And uh, my father said, well, that sounds like a fun case. Yeah, sent him down to the office. So he said, Timmy, go over to the office with me. So we go over to the office and I, 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 gave him his initial patient confidential case history to fill out and brought him in the room and he was sitting on the, the adjusting table and my father walked in the room and my father did a palpatory evaluation of his neck, adjusted C5 and C3, 4, 5, I think. You know that mnemonic C3, 4, and 5 keeps the diaphragm alive. Yeah, he he adjusted the his neck. I think I'm um, just boom like that. He said, "Okay, go home and get some get some sleep," and walked out of the room. And that was his history. That was his consultation. His exam. Yeah, I think I think he was he he related enough to the patient to say, "Oh, so you got hiccups, eh, guy?" <laughs> and that that was that was the communication. And you know we 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 have these long drawn out histories and consultations that we do in the profession now for both for protection of the patient and protection of us. But um, he he cut right down to the chase. You got a problem? I'll fix it. Go home. I got up and walked out to the front desk. The man came out. He had stopped hip copying after seventeen days. You know where he couldn't really eat, drink water, speak, talk, sleep, or do anything. He just kept hip copying. And he said, how much do I owe him? And I said, I went like this. I said, seven. And he says, 700? And I said, no, seven, seven dollars. He says, because because I'll give him seven. I'll give him a check for 700 right now. If he wants 700, I'm, I'm happy to pay him. I said, no, just seven dollars. He couldn't believe that it was seven dollars to fix 17 days of hiccup. And uh, he said, well, now do I have to come back? And I said, what did my dad tell you? He said, he said to go home and get some sleep. I said, well, then go home and get some sleep. I so said- do, do you mind me asking, Tim, just cut into the chase here. What, obviously I've got an idea on this, but can you explain what you believe happened when your dad did the adjustments on the, on the, the upper cervicals? Oh, absolutely. I have no doubt that uh, what happened was he released the pressure off the phrenic nerve, which is the nerve that goes into the diaphragm, and the diaphragm started working again. Then it was trapped. I mean, it's that simple, nerve pressure. You know, people would ask, because remember, I, I had mentioned that for the first 25 years, they didn't have a license. So they weren't allowed to diagnose. I'm not saying that they didn't, diagnosed they definitely analyzed the spine tremendously well but they weren't allowed to say well we're going to treat you for asthma we're going to even today in new york state that's not allowed we're yeah, or the uk you. or the uk as well yeah. it's, it's the same here. Now, it is in many states for example mm -hmm. in illinois that you know you can you can treat a patient for any condition and diagnose it and say that's why you're treating them but not in new york state so yeah, that's what happened. That's amazing. L listen, Tim, um, there's so much information that you've got. Would you be willing to come back on this podcast? Um, because I've got so many more questions to ask. <laughs> I would be delighted. I'd be delighted, Alan. No, that'd be great. That'd be really good. So I'm going to set up another time. Look, I want to thank you, Tim, for your time. I really do. Oh, it's thank my you so pleasure. much. And uh, wonderful speaking to, you, to your beautiful wife earlier. If we can arrange another time to speak, then that'd be good. That'd be awesome. But I want to thank you right now uh, for being on be, Being Human and, and explaining about your past, the, the history of, of chiropractic to a certain extent, 
and uh, the things that uh, Rockefellers, their involvement um, for and against. It's, uh, it's, chiro it's, chiro it is very interesting, isn't it, that one Rockefeller really supported chiropractic? Absolutely. I love that. And I didn't know that until you told me. So that And other forms of natural health care. He could palpate a spine. Wow. Okay. An interesting, that's an interesting person for me to read about. But I want to thank mm -hmm. you very much on, on behalf of uh, all of our audience. We were thinking the future is going to be a lot more chiropractors. Um, I thank you. I really appreciate that. And I would like you to come back. And I hope that you're not just being polite. Thank you so no, I much. Enjoyed it. I enjoy your interview style. You do a wonderful job. Oh, you're just saying, don't make me blush. Thanks so much, Tim. Bless you and bless your wife. And I'll speak to you very, very shortly. Thank you for being on. And um, guys, if, you, if you're happy with what we've spoken about today and you've enjoyed it, then please like and share. Thank you for joining us today. Muchas gracias, amigo. Ah, gracias, gracias. <laughs>